Thank you so much, dear brother, for praying. And I want to thank the elders under the leadership of Brother Sam and Daniel and JP and Levi for inviting us to come and to share with you on this incredible day. Are you excited in any way? There were two men running to the tomb, uh, Peter and John, and John ended up outrunning Peter because he wanted to know, is my Savior alive? But on that day, there were also people that doubted. And so we read in Scripture that even as Jesus was raised from the dead, there were some disciples walking home later on in that afternoon. And they were sad, it says. They were doubting. Did he really rise? Is he really alive? Praise God. And so let us turn to Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 27. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 27. If you have your Bible. And there it says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emos, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. That's about seven miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said to them, what manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk? And you're sad. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And, and you have not known the things which are come to pass in these days? Don't you know? And in verse 19, and he said to them, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain woman also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre, that's the grave. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. He was alive. Hallelujah. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Then he, that is Jesus, said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the <laughs> prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning in Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so when I read this passage, I was wondering, what is it that Jesus spoke to them about? Why isn't it recorded for us? And then I realized that God has given us this beautiful book called the Bible. It's all recorded in here. We don't know precisely which passages Jesus used, but he used truth. He used to explain to them what they were wondering about. And so this morning we're going to share from the books of the Bible one or two verses from each book to help us understand that Savior, that Christ, that Messiah. Praise God. And so in the book of Genesis is the first promise of the Messiah. And there, uh, Jesus is the seed of the woman. 
Uh, Jesus was saying, I am the seed of the woman described in the writings of Moses in the first book of the Bible. And that is the first pro prophecy about him. And it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And there it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And here God is speaking to the serpent. And in Revelation 20, verse 2, uh, the serpent is identified as the dragon of old, who is the devil and Satan. And so here in Genesis 3.15, uh, God spoke to this serpent, the devil, and told him, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between th thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And here God said, my son will come through a woman. He will defeat death and hell. Death and hell, and here's the first prophecy. And then in the book of Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 23, we read, For the Lord will pass to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house to smite you. You see, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin, beloved. And if your visitor here this morning, we greet you, we love you, we are so glad you came. And the Christians here know these passages and that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And beloved, there's only one way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, says the Lord Jesus. And so he talks about the destroyer here. And uh, so if that destroyer is not turned away from you, you will go into an eternity of hell. But Jesus says, I don't want you to go there because I am the Passover lamb. Look to me. Amen. Trust me. Repent, give your life to me, and you will have eternal life. Praise God. And then there's another prophecy in Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. And it says, In one house shall it be eaten, that thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. And this talks about the Passover lamb. And it says that there should be no bone broken in the Passover lamb. And when we read the New Testament where Jesus died on the cross for us, the bones of the two thieves were broken to make them die quick. But the Passover lamb, no bone should be broken. And this is what happened with our beloved Savior. Then we go on to the book of Leviticus. And here Jesus uh, the Messiah is the atonement and the high priest for us all. And in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 33, And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the congregation." Jesus is your high priest. He will represent you before God. We have all fallen short of the glory of God by sinning, but we can be right with God through the high priest, Jesus Christ. Praise God. Then we go on to the book of Numbers. And uh, Jesus likely said uh, to the two disciples here, about the bronze serpent that was seen in the desert. And in Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serp serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. 
And in the New Testament, it is said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He will save you forever. He will love you forever. But you got to repent. You got to ask him because he will not do it against your will. But if you ask him, you can be new today. You can start a new life today. You don't have to go into eternity of hell. Praise God. Praise God. Then in the next book in Deuteronomy, Jesus said, I am also a prophet. And he talked to the two disciples, uh, likely about Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18. And there it says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, uh, like unto thee, Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And then in the next book, in the book of Joshua, we see the Messiah as the commander of the army of the Lord. And there in Joshua chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, uh, it is said, uh, Joshua chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, and he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And in verse 15, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. That's the Messiah, the Lord of hosts. He will defend you so that you will be safe for eternity. He will be with you if you look to him, if you ask him to be with you. Praise God. And then in the next book, in the book of Judges, God was with all of the judges in the next book and delivered them. And Jesus says he is our deliverer. And in Judges chapter 6, 12, uh, this talks about Gideon. Gideon needed help, okay? And there it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with you, thou mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you. And he has brought you here to this fellowship, to this church this morning because he wants to encourage you. You're, not, you're never alone. He's with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And each one of the 17 judges was a savior to their nation and representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the book of Ruth, uh, uh, Jesus represents the kinsman redeemer. And perhaps he talked to these two disciples. And in Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, it says, And Naomi had a kinsman uh, of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. We find grace and forgiveness with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have a new start in life. I had a new start in life. And many of you had a new start in life. Praise God. He is your kinsman redeemer. Now, what is a kinsman redeemer? A kinsman redeemer was a male relative who, according to the various laws of the Jewish people, had the privilege or responsibility to act for a relative who was in trouble. Maybe you don't consider yourself in trouble, beloved, but if you live in sin, you are in trouble. Whether you believe it or not, the truth is you are in great danger. You are in danger. And here is a kinsman redeemer who wants to help you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to be with you. And then in 1 Samuel, Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed king, and he will reign. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2.10, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Jesus talked to the, those two disciples and told them the Messiah is king. Don't you realize yet, yet 
Yes, he died, but he is alive, and he's, he will be king forever and reign forever. And in 1 Samuel 2.10 it says, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And then in the next book, in 2 Samuel, Jesus is a descendant of King David. He is a descendant. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, God is speaking to David here in this verse, and he's saying, And when your days are fulfilled, and when you shall sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And then in 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, it tells us that this kingdom goes beyond David because there it says, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. There's no end to it. Christ will reign. Christ will return to this earth. And we must all be ready. He will come to reign on earth for a thousand years and then set up his kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. And then in uh, uh, First Kings, uh, the Messiah Jesus reflects his father as a covenant-keeping and merciful God. And in First Kings 8, verse 23, it says, and he, and it's, uh, it was said by Solomon, by King Solomon, and he said, Lord God of Israel, there's no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepeth covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. And it's been such a delight for me to be with you here because I... I, I just see your hearts. I'm touched by your commitment to God. I'm touched by your prayers. I'm touched by your love for the Lord. And never stop that. Continue forever. Amen. Praise God. And let those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, let them know. Share with them uh, all of the glory that Jesus represents. And then in 2 Kings, we see Elisha reminding us of a Christ that is of the armies from heaven. Because sometimes we are surrounded by evil. Sometimes we don't know which way to turn. And here Elisha was surrounded by an enemy army, and his servant uh, was very much afraid. He said, how can we survive? We're surrounded by all of these armies, horses, chariots, soldiers. How can we survive? And we are in a time of evil. But in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, and he, that is Elisha, answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Praise God. And in verse 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And then in 1 John 4.4 4, 4 in the New Testament, Jesus repeats that promise. And he said, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. How? Because greater is he, that is Jesus, that is in you than he, the he being the devil, that is in the world. Amen. Your captain is the host of the armies, and you can succeed. Never be afraid. Trust him with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then in First Chronicles, we see Christ on David's throne forever. In First Chronicles 17, verse 27, Now therefore let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may be before thee forever. For thou blessest, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. And again, here it is confirmed that the Messiah will be on that throne forever. Praise God. 
And then in the next book, Second Chronicles, we are reminded of God who hears from heaven. And then in Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 25, Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 25, it says, Then hear thou from the heavens, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest to them and their fathers. And here Jesus represents uh, the new covenant uh, that we later on uh, 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 also hear about. And then in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Hear what the Spirit says, To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life. So if you're here and you say, well, I don't want to hear all of these things you're telling me, you're doing yourself great, great, great harm. Hear the voice from the Lord from heaven to you personally, to each one of you. If you don't know Christ, I beg you, I counsel you, try him. He is the Lord. He is joy. He is peace. And he is love. And if you want to experience a new life, today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. Praise God. And then in the book of Ezra, we are now coming to uh, the, the uh, uh, prophets. In the, in the book of Ezra, we are reminded of the faithful rebuilding of the temple. And in Ezra chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be it known unto the king, and that was King Darius, that we went into the province of Judea to the house of the great God, which is builded with great stones and timber, is laid in the walls. And this work goeth fast on and prospereth in their hands. And Jesus reminded us that he rebuilds the temple. He rebuilt his own temple. And in John chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy me, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And today is the day when he raised up that temple, and he came back to life. And then he said to the Jews in verse 20, for, uh, sorry, then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? But they didn't understand. In verse 21, it tells us Jesus spoke of the temple of his body. And then when Jesus was raised from the dead, now they understood what Jesus was talking about. Now in the next book, uh, Nehemiah, God restores broken walls through Nehemiah. And this portrays Christ in his uh, ministry to restore broken lives. Perhaps there's someone here this morning who's addicted by drugs who can't get free. Perhaps there are those that are addicted to pornography. Perhaps there are those that are addicted to gambling. Perhaps there are those that cannot get along with their wives or their husband. But I counsel you, Christ can restore your life. Amen. If you turn to him, there are many here that can give you a testimony that he is the Christ that he is a wonderful Savior. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 5, it says, And I said unto the king, If it please thee, king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me into Judea, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And then Jesus said in Psalm 147, verse 3, I heal the brokenhearted and bind up the wounds. Perhaps some of you are brokenhearted here. I went through life seeking fulfillment. I was seeking joy. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it in poverty. I couldn't find it in riches. But I found it in Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my God. And so you can have your broken heart mended. You can have your wounds healed if you would like to this day. And then in the book of Esther, Queen Esther, like Christ, puts her life uh, uh, in the place of death to save people. And in Esther chapter 4, verse 16, 
uh, she said, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens, we will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So as Christians, we have come to the point that regardless of what the world says, regardless of the attacks of the evil one, regardless of the devil, we say, if I perish, I perish. We are with Jesus. And Jesus prayed in the garden, and he prayed, Father, let this cup pass. But nevertheless, let your will be done. If I perish, I perish. I will perish for all of the world. I will give life to all of the world, praise God. And then in the book of Job, uh, Job refers uh, to the Messiah, to the ever-living Redeemer. And we read in the book of Job, chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Oh, how wonderful this is. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Praise God, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin has worms and is destroyed my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Praise God. Praise God. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. That's what Job said. The Redeemer is the Christ. Yes, he died, but he came to life again. And so he's sharing uh, with these two disciples, uh, there is a Messiah. And he is a Redeemer who will live forever. Praise God. And then in the book of Psalms, it says in Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Praise God. And then in in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, it says the Messiah is the Son of God. If you ever doubted that, it's, it's written. Beloved, refer to it. Never doubt, he's also God. And there it says in Psalm 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. And then later on, God spoke from heaven to confirm it. So if if you're not sure which of these faith are real, which of these faith can I trust, you can trust uh, this wonderful faith, the Christian faith, because uh, here uh, it is confirmed that Christ is also God's son and he's God. And then in Psalm 16, verse 10, and here Jesus might have said to the two disciples and to Cleopas, now, beloved brothers, don't you know Psalm 16, 10? Because there it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Corruption means the degradation of the body. And so here, praise God, praise God, uh, the Messiah will be resurrected. Why don't you believe it? And then in Psalm 22, verses 14 to 18, it tells us a thousand years before it ever happened, a thousand years. This is a very important passage, beloved, if you don't know it. If you don't know it, because there it says, I'm poured out like water, Psalm 22, verses 14 to 18. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. And my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. This speaks of crucifixion. And verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death, For dogs have compassed compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. And here he repeats again that it means crucifixion. They pierced my hands, hands and my feet, beloved, a thousand years before it ever happened. 
And then verse 17, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Here again is repeated that none of his bones shall be broken, praise God. And then in verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And what an incredible miracle this is, where uh, the garments were both gambled over and departed, both. And you will see this in the New Testament at the cross, where both uh, the inner garment was not parted but gambled over, and his other clothes was cut uh, between the soldiers. And beloved, this is our great Messiah. The Messiah is walking with these two disciples and Cleopas and saying, have you not read the scriptures? Why don't you believe that the Messiah will rise? Why are you sad? Why are you discouraged? You have this great faith. You know through the written word of God that I am the Christ, that I am the Messiah. And then in Psalm 110 verse 1 it says, Messiah will rise from the dead and sit at the right hand of God. And here the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Praise God. And then in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, wisdom was incarnate in the living Christ, in the Messiah. And in Proverbs 8, 28 to 30, it says, And when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the foundations of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. And then Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 confirms that saying, okay? And in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, it talks about Jesus. It talks about the Messiah. And there it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And in Ecclesiastes, life is but a vapor, but Christ gives life more abundantly. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 2, it says a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. All throughout Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, you know, riches is wind, your pride is wind, uh, all that you desire in your old flesh, it's wind, it's going to pass by. It's going to be gone, like a flower you're going to wilt away. What will be in your life? What will be in the future? What will be in eternity about you? And then Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, in the second part, I am come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. Praise God. Amen. And then in the Song of Solomon, the next book, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3, and there it says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. And that talks about Christians, and it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is represented in the book of Solomon. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Praise God. And then in the next book of Isaiah, we find the Messiah is the anointed deliverer of Israel, but he's also a suffering servant. And there, uh, first of all, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we have the confirmation that Jesus would be born of a virgin. And you've got to remember some of these verses because they're so important. They prove your faith, okay? So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 15, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 
So Messiah would be God and man. And in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, if you want to ever have a proof that Jesus is God, there the prophet Isaiah proclaims him also as God. And there it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And Isaiah prophesied that many, many years before Christ was born. The Messiah will make the blind see and the lame walk. In Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf, deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame walk and leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. But now Jesus talks to the disciples, and he says, but Cleopas, you read this passage, but you neglected to understand uh, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. You neglected to understand. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. And then in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, it tells us, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He bruised him for us. To cover our sins. To take away our sins. He bruised his own son. He hurt his own son. He had him crucified. He has put him to grieve. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And Cleopas, you have to understand, the Messiah had to die so that you could live, that you could have life eternally. And then in the next book, in the book of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet is a type of Christ. Jesus also wept for the lost. And in Jeremiah 13, verse 17, Jeremiah 13, verse 17, but if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. And mine eye shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. And there was judgment, beloved. Many pastors do not tell you that there is judgment coming. God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. He's a God of love. He's also a God of justice. He will not stand by forever, beloved. So this is the time of making things right with God. Don't wait any moment. Don't even wait an hour. Wait to make things right with God, that you are safe and secure in his blessed hand. And then Jesus wept in Luke chapter 19, uh, uh, verse 41 to 43. And when he has come near, beheld the city. It was the city of Jerusalem. He wept over that city because the city had missed their day of visitation from the Lord Jesus Christ. They wouldn't believe him. You don't want to believe him. God will not force you. Jesus will not force you. But you're going to go into an eternity of hell. I don't want you to go there. Because I love you. I love each one of you. Never go there, okay? Make things right with God. Praise God. And then uh, in uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Jesus the Messiah was also announced in Jeremiah. And there it says in 23, verse 5, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in this earth. Praise God. And then in the next book, in the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah laments about the justice of God. He's so sad. He's weeping. He's a weeping prophet. 
because judgment has taken place. And in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 42, he said, We have transgressed, we have rebelled, thou hast not pardoned. Will that be representative of some of you? I pray not. I pray not. I pray not. God says, I'll wash your sins whiter than snow if you want to. I'll be there for you if you want to. But you've got to repent. You've got to turn from your way of life. And then in the book of Ezekiel, God promised a new heart, a heart of flesh. And we read this in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Praise God. Praise God. He's risen. He will give you a new heart. I couldn't love people for 50 odd years. I had been hurt greatly. I had been sexually misused. I couldn't love people, okay? And so I rejected them. But now God, God has helped me to forgive those that have hurt me. He's helped me to start a new life, to turn around from the things that have affected me. And it's possible to start a new life, beloved. Start a new life this day. Uh, God will give it to you on this Easter Sunday if you would like to. And then we go to the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, here, uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar, he sees Christ in a big fire. And in Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, uh, it says, He, that is King Nebuchadnezzar, answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Praise God. Praise God. And so here, um, uh, uh, three had been thrown into the fire. Their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they would not bow to an idol. They would not bow to false gods. They had to go into the fire. But who was with them? Christ Jesus was with them. They were not alone. You see, he will not leave you alone. And then uh, Daniel also prophesied that the Messiah would be cut off. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, means he will be killed, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolation are determined. And Daniel experienced God through the shutting of the mouth of the lions, beloved. And I have experienced that with mosquitoes when I prayed, okay? God shut the mouth of mosquitoes, praise God, in Africa, uh, where I was exposed to, to a lot of mosquitoes and prayed and they stayed away. And God is able to still do that these days. And then in the book of Hosea, he is judgment, but also the faithful husband. And we read in Hosea chapter 4, verse 3. Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea and shall also be taken away. And beloved, animals are dying, fishes are dying, and we're coming close to judgment. Will you not turn to God? And then, beloved, we go on to the book of Joel. We are told to prepare for judgment. And in Joel chapter 2, verse 1, uh, Joel shouted. Can I shout a little bit? Amen. Blow! 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 Blow the trumpet! Amen. There's danger coming. There's incredible danger coming. You have no idea what this God is like for those that do not follow Christ. Yes, he's love, but he cannot create a new heaven and a new earth without taking care of sin 
and sinful people. He will not allow sinful people into heaven. He cannot, beloved. I'm sorry, I scared the baby, okay? <laughs> but I want to let you know, here in Joel chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Blow ye the trump in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And then in the book of Amos, and we're almost through with, with all of the books of the Old Testament, but are you still okay for a couple more minutes? Amen. 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 Praise God. And in the book of Amos, we are reminded, prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. Are you ready, beloved? Are you ready to meet him? And in verse 11 and 12 of the book of Amos, it says, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, God did that. He took care of evil. Don't let anyone mislead you. That's what God did. He will deal with evil. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have you not returned unto me, says the Lord. Therefore thus I will do unto you, O Israel. And because I will do this unto you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. And he's saying that to each one of us. Prepare to meet your God. And then the next one is the prophet Obadiah. He also warns of the day of the Lord when the Messiah returns. And in Obadiah 1 verse 15 it says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto you. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. And then in the book of Jonah, the next book, the prophet was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, and then God pardoned a sinful city. He will pardon you if, re if you return to him. Jonah 1 verse 17 says, Now the Lord hath prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then... In the book of Micah, we have another wonderful prophecy in the book of Micah. In book of Micah 5 verse 2, it tells us that the Messiah would be born in that little town of Bethlehem. And Jesus was born there as a visitor, but he was born in Bethlehem. And in verse uh, 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be a little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth hath been from old, from everlasting to everlasting. And then the prophet Nahum warns us, that's the next prophet in, in the book, in the Bible. God is love, but also reserves wrath for his enemies. And in Nahum chapter 1 verse 2, God is jealous He's jealous when you have other gods before him. If your TV is your God, if your social stuff is, is your God, uh, if, if um, cricket is your God, if uh, whatever, money is your God, if your family is God, God is jealous. He wants to be first in our lives. And here, Nahum 1 verse 2, God is jealous and the Lord revenges, the Lord revenges and is furious the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. And then in, in the next book, in Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid, O Lord. Revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. And uh, Jesus probably talked to the uh, two disciples and said, you know, I have come that God would have mercy in the midst of wrath. I gave my life as the Messiah. 
I came that you could live. I came that you could have life more abundantly. <laughs> and then in the prophet of Zephaniah, uh, it tells us uh, that the nation is called to repentance. And Jesus called all of the churches to repentance in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Uh, actually, there were seven churches and five he called to repentance, even in the midst of grace. So if anyone teaches you that repentance, it's not necessary. It is from hell, okay? It is from hell because you need to repent of your sins and turn around. And then in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, Gather yourself together, yea, gather together, O nation, uh, not, not desired, before the decree bring forth before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Please repent. And then the prophet Haggai reminds us of the glory of the later house of God. And in Haggai chapter 2 verse 9, it says, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And this place I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of the latter house is greater. And it is greater because of the Messiah, because of the Son of God. And he's making a way for you and for me. And in the book of Zechariah, uh, that's 500 years before Christ was born. He tells us about the pierced Messiah he tells us about the pierced Son of God in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And he shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And then, beloved, we come to the last book of the Old Testament. Uh, those were the books that were written that the two disciples had to look at. They knew about these books. And so here, the prophet Malachi, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 2, he, he warns of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the second coming, he will come as a lion. He will no longer come as a sacrificial lamb. He will exercise judgment. And in Malachi chapter 3 verse 2 it says, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And beloved, if you think you're strong, if you think that you can manage on your own, if you think you can go against God, let me read from Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains, Fall on us! Rocks fall on us, hide us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. And so, beloved, we have come to the end of the Old Testament. Perhaps another day we will go through the books of the New Testament for you to see Christ. But these two disciples got a first-hand lesson from the Messiah, the Son of God. And then what happened is they sat down for dinner. They started to eat. And as Jesus broke bread, all of a sudden they saw him. They saw the face of Jesus. They knew it was him, but yet he disappeared before their eyes. And now Brother Brian asked last night a question, and he asked the question, why didn't you follow? Why didn't you follow? Why don't you follow? Why don't you follow Jesus? 
And I have a, a similar question today. You have heard truth. You have heard about the Messiah. You have heard about the Son of God. What will you do about Jesus? What will you do about Jesus? And those two disciples, they got excited. They were nine miles from Jerusalem, uh, sort of late in the evening. It was all dark. There are thieves and robbers on the road. They couldn't contain themselves. I have seen Jesus. We have seen Jesus. We must tell the other disciples. And so they, they stopped dinner and they started running towards Jerusalem to meet up with the 11 disciples. And they told the disciples, we have seen Jesus. And you can read later on here in Luke. In Luke it says that even as Cleopas and his brother shared their story with the disciples, Jesus came and appeared to them. And perhaps you have seen Jesus this morning. Perhaps you have seen him in one of the verses that I quoted to you. Perhaps you have seen that you must be right with God, that you cannot be in your present state, that you must get out of that, and that you must be right with the living Savior.